There is no one vendor who has the solution to it. It's a solution, again, a stack that you're gonna have to build for your organization in a way that makes sense for your, your, your needs, your workflows. It's going to be changing a lot, all of the time. I know of really no client that I work with, uh, and probably none that I can think of, that in this day and age have a very static set of workflows and kind of supply chain logistics. It's, oh, there's some new device, and so there's a new encoding format, or hey, there's a whole new codec, or oh, people want metadata in this format now, or you know, oh, we have to deliver to these new guys and they have another API that we need to write to. So it's constantly evolving, but again, the nice thing about digital technology and a lot of this stack being software-based is we can manipulate it when we need to. Um, if you take the right approach, again, I'll, I'll beat the drum of really thinking about it in terms of service, uh, you know, services-oriented uh, kind of architecture and building kind of a hub that you can then rewire pieces of on the fly and, and, and build the new workflows that you need as new requirements get handed off to you, um, that you know, is gonna be a useful way of looking at it. And again, think of it as the stack that forms a big old state machine. And I think that's as close as I've come to kind of wrapping my head around it. And hopefully I will be closer after the end of today and I hope you guys will as well. So I think with that, I'm ready to hand it off to the first official speaker. Thank you, Nick. And our next presentation will be from Eric Carson from Dillette, and I'll talk about hybrid cloud-based workflows. And I can't open the file. Let me make sure we... Has that changed from the last file you sent us before, Eric? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Where's that USB cable? It's just, I, I keep the one I got on here until yesterday. I know that this is today at 7.22. Is that today? That's it. That's, oh, 7.22 a.m.? Is that right yeah. now? Okay. All right. Sorry. Okay. That's my guy. Thank you. Hey, good morning. I'm so glad everybody made it for breakfast and then we all chose the same thing to eat. So shockingly enough, right? Please don't wake up all at once, okay? My name's Eric Carson, I'm with Dillette. I take care of our business development, our technical evangelism here for North America. Uh, and I'm really excited that you guys invited me. Uh, I wanted to kind of give you an introduction to the Elastic Media Supply Chain. I, this term gets thrown out a lot. Before we get into that, I thought I would share with you kind of what's going on in my life. Some of you know me, some of you don't. You know, I have a daughter that's getting ready to graduate from high school. This is a big change in my life. She loves animals, loves the animals, was driving around in our neighborhood the other day, got pulled over by the police. It happens, right? You have people, teenagers out there? Yes, okay. So she has penguins in the backseat, right? The policeman says, hello. This is not correct. I feel like maybe you should take these to the zoo. She says, hey, that's not a problem. We'll get that done. Later in the afternoon, same officer, daughter again. Hey, these penguins still in the back seat. I thought I told you to take them to the zoo. She says, hey, I did. Now we're gonna go to a movie. <laughs> now think about, now we're gonna go to a movie and what that means, right? That, what does that change from when some of us were growing up to what our children are growing up and what that means and what that will mean later, right? I'm gonna go to a movie, I'm gonna watch content, okay? And the reason that that has changed, of course, is different consumer habits, but also how we are available to deliver content that changes that statement. So let's talk about that elastic supply chain. But first, let's talk about some technology changes that have enabled that statement to change. What is this thing called cloud? Everybody's got the same definition of cloud, right? Yes? All right, well, let's start with the beginning. In the beginning, there was the on-premise data center. And it was great, and it was good. This was your in-house guys that brought you all of the compute storage and networking you needed. It was on your workstations. It was in our data centers. And you can run whatever you want on top of that. It's your applications and your data. You take care of it. We'll give you the boxes. You install the stuff. And it was great. It worked for years, right? And then virtualization came along. And this was cool. 
for the first time, right, your IT guys were coming to you and going, oh, this is amazing. You should really try this stuff out because now you can take this stack of software and all your media services and slap them on multiple machines. You can clone them. We can spin them up when you want them. And then you said, but my vendors don't actually support any of this. And they said, ah, don't worry about it. So, of course, virtualization enabled our friends Amazon and Microsoft and Google and IBM to start supplying services of that infrastructure available because of virtualization, right? So here's a stack of compute software networking that you can buy as you need it. Again, you bring your own applications to the table, you install it, but you pay as you go on the infrastructure. The next obvious evolution of that was our friends at Adobe, our friends at Microsoft that said, hey, I've got applications I'd love to sell to you and I'll take care of everything. And if you let me take care of everything, I'll spin this stuff up and down and you just pay me a small monthly fee, right? Software as a service. What's really exciting in the media space right now and honestly beyond the media space is what's happening in between where maybe you want someone to bring to you not just the infrastructure, but you want more control than a single vendor giving you a stack of software. You say, hey, bring me a platform that's already tuned for my media operation and give me control of a pre-selected group of vendors that work on that platform that I can then build a media supply chain around. And this is what's happening within the vendor space of m and &E right now. Some of the vendors are being very public about it. Some are going to be more public about it this year. Over the next 12 to 18 months, this is going to be one of the major changes in the vendor space for media and entertainment is platform as a service to supply a media supply chain. And what does that look like, right? A very generic media supply chain, I've got contribution that comes in, I've got to get stuff into my business. I want to make sure that if I need a media transform, that happens. So here I've got transcoders that need to be available in that supply chain. And these could of course be stuff like AWS Elemental, it could be Amberfin, it could be Vantage, it could be FFmpeg. You could also have the need to enhance the metadata around that media, right? Maybe I need a user typing stuff in and logging what's happening. Maybe I need to connect this to a cognitive service, again, like recognition or Azure Media Services, where I'm gonna add maybe some facial recognition or some object recognition. Of course, I wanna do some packaging. I, I, I can't just deal with this media. I wanna enhance the media and the metadata and slap the still images together and get the EPG data rolling. I'm gonna produce an IMF package, I'm gonna produce a cable labs package because I wanna send it somewhere, right? So, so we wanna have those QC vendors, we wanna have the, the distribution vendors all on board with that supply chain. So basically, connect this stuff together for me. But what really makes an elastic media supply chain for media entertainment? It means that we have elasticity and cost rules available within this supply chain. I need, as the customer, the ability to go in and say, hey, keep this stuff running when the queue gets 90% full, and then start spinning more stuff up, or leave it running longer because I don't wanna wait for things to start up, or don't spend my money until the cost of that Amazon computing goes down to this. So that media is not valuable enough to really spend at the current rate of compute. Make sense? Of course I want something that allows me to design or modify what's going on in this chain, okay? I, I don't want one static definition. Now a lot of the vendors today have a couple of different methods on this. A lot of them will say, hey, draw me out what you want. My professional service guys will come around and we'll modify that supply chain and we'll deploy it for you. And that works brilliantly. More vendors are coming along and giving you visual environments that you can design your workflow yourself and deploy that on your Elastic supply chain. So you have choices here on what that design environment looks like. And that last piece you want, you wanna know how much money did I spend and how much is it being used? That spend is important, right? You, not just for your business, but also these contributors, do they always give you the right thing? They do not, right? 
If er, it, anybody getting at 100% perfect content out there? No. Okay. Maybe someday you want to start to push some of those costs back. By the way, 50% of your content doesn't show up in the correct format. I'm going to start billing you for every one of those that was wrong. Guess what starts happening then? Maybe your content starts coming in differently, right? So, or at least your business has a cost recovery mechanism. So what do you get by migrating some of these workflows to the cloud and using either public or private cloud infrastructure? This first one, and I realize some of you are gonna go, Eric, you're crazy, it's not more secure. But here's why security can come with those workflows. You have automatic updates that are generally available within these environments, both from the operating system and at the vendor level, right? So these applications are always up to date. As security issues occur, those updates can be applied for you. You also have the ability to scale up and down. What's interesting about Elasticity right, is that I don't have to leave these processes running all of the time. I can spin up transcode as I need it. I can spin up file delivery as I need it. So I have an ability to adapt to what my peak demand will be. Financially, that's great because now I can cost things out. Uh, as our good friends uh, in, the, in the business like to say, at the cost of a, pr of a piece of food, right? It shouldn't cost me more to produce a file than it should to buy a burrito, okay? Everybody's heard that one before? Of course you have. Uh, you can be very agile. Remember, what does wa I wanna go watch a movie mean? It means very different things now, and that's gonna change again. So as that changes the next time, you're not stuck with an existing set of capacity or infrastructure. You can change that and adapt to what that next habit will be. And of course, you can make this workflow available in any zone around the nation and around the world. It's very easy with virtualization and cloud stacks to make this transportable across availability zones. Make sense? Great. And I really hope that this worked out for you because now I want to talk to you about why I'm really here. Before we get there, why, what makes this, where are some differentiators? You do have trends that you can monitor and you want to monitor. Is my utilization really matching what I expected? What processes are really sucking up a lot of time? What processes are my mo most costly? So now you can start to exercise some vendor control over those vendors that you love so much. Hey, your process is really costing me more money or more time. I'd like to maybe try another one of those, right? You also have financial reporting. How many instances do I have running? How much is this costing me today? How much did I spend yesterday? And with all of the usage data, we can also start to use predictive analytics to give you an idea across an entire supply chain workflow. When will that thing actually be done? Taking into account the average time of processes and the average time of the users that interact with those processes. All of this is available today in different ways from different vendors, okay? Not all of us are ready to move to the cloud fully, so let's talk about what's actually working today. What can you use with all of the investments that you've already made in your infrastructure today? You know, for a multitude of reasons, it's not always ideal to move an entire supply chain directly to the cloud, okay? But you do have the ability to still take advantage of all those elasticity components without migrating the entire operation into a public cloud environment. So I wanna show you a couple of case studies of customers we've done work with uh, that have utilized public cloud infrastructure without migrating the entire thing out. That first one is a content review and approval workflow. Okay, pretty common use case, right? This was a Japanese customer, so could have easily been anywhere region in the world, but when we looked at this workflow, one of the lessons that we learned when we look at migrating any part of workflows to the cloud is we wanna start at the edges of that workflow. So think about, again, that very generic media supply chain, right? I've got some level of start. It's going to have an ingest. It's gonna have an approval. It's gonna be connected to some level of systems, okay, for registration. I'm gonna enhance that metadata somehow. I'm gonna have a level of media service that's gonna be applied to transform or modify that media, and I'm gonna send it out somewhere. Ultimately, I'm trying to get from here to there, right? 
That's what all of our media operations do. Get me from this thing to the thing that actually makes me money. And what we know is beyond linear play out, that thing that makes us money is mostly external to our operation anymore. It's not as much dependent on the linear play out. Where it's not, and if that needs to be in the cloud, is the ingest also coming from an external source and could this be a cloud-based operation? And in the Japanese customer's case, that was their major pain point, was a lot of external approval and ingest that was occurring. And again, tons of it was wrong. When they were waiting on it to come into their operation, they were having a lot of wasted capacity and a lot of wasted user time because the content was showing up incorrectly. So what, what did we do in this case? You introduce here an external upload portal something that you can host in a public cloud environment, uh, like AWS, like Azure, like any provider that, that gives you infrastructure as a service, okay? And you put your review and validation tools up there. So this can be something like, the, in the Telestream cloud, you've got the vid checker, you've got you know, the Aurora from, from Tektronix, you've got uh, Interis Baton, these can all sit right there in that public cloud in infrastructure. And now you've got not only the ability to keep content away from your on-premise infrastructure until it's actually approved, but you also have the ability to have the users interact with that content before it shows up. And this is what this customer found out. They, they actually thought they were building a way to keep bad content out. What they gained was this external review portal so that their users could actually do the review while they were on the train in the morning. So they were waiting until 9 a.m. before, and by 12, everybody was complaining that all the content was just terrible, and now by 9 a.m., everybody had already watched and clicked OK. It was a massive improvement for this particular customer. So they have not only the ability to have that single point of origin, but also this, this very uh, remote, approval workflow, and because that approval workflow was hosted in a, a single web page, they also added a chat function to that that they were able to collaborate. So users that needed maybe a manager or another, another guy to go look at this, he could just chat with him and say, can you take a look at, at this particular job? So, and they could do that again while they were on the train. So, um, I'm a big fan of this workflow. It's a very easy one to port into a public cloud infrastructure. Very simple one to leave your on-premise storage and on-premise media processing and systems in place and just push, again, those edges out to the public cloud. Make sense? It's okay if it doesn't. I'll be available for questions after. All right, let's talk about our second case, disaster recovery. Uh, again, a fairly simple one to understand, one that actually works today in the public cloud and is in use at multiple customer sites, right? You could have a lot of different reasons for putting temporary systems in the cloud. You could want to spin up something for staging or training, or maybe you've got a temporary event that you want to cover. But this business continuity case adds some permanence to that. I really want something that's not on my site or close to my site that'll be available in the event that something happens. Okay, that something doesn't have to be a tsunami or a zombie outbreak or anything. And these are just four examples. Don't get scared. Okay. All right, so what does that look like? This starts with a site evaluation. You have constant equipment that's available in your supply chain, in your operation, right? A lot of that's got individual processes, storage that is fairly transient based on today's operations or the next 30 days of operations. And I've probably got some database behind there that's giving me my states, right? So from that evaluation, we can port then states, a temporary amount of, of data, maybe the next seven days or a constant seven days of FIFO buffer, and a copy of the media services that you need. Remember that thing, virtualization, we started off, that was really cool. We can take virtual copies of those media services and kick them up into a public cloud environment and just leave them there, turned off. Connect them all together, leave them off. So your total cost in the at rest state is fairly minimal. You spend a little time setting it up and it's off. You're doing some data replication every day, very low maintenance item. When you have a need to turn this on, 
And there's a couple of ways you can turn this on, right? You can turn this on from a heartbeat event that's monitoring states inside of your environment. And when that heartbeat stops, hey, go turn that on. Amazon and Microsoft and Google all have controls that let you uh, handle this. Uh, or you can turn it on manually. Flip that sucker to standby. And now I'm actually going to take all those virtual machines and my processes, get them running, and get them attached to all that storage and data states that are current in my operation. Then we redirect users. Again, when we use public cloud technology or any sort of browser-based technology, it becomes fairly easy to redirect users from an on-premise client experience to an external client presence. The users don't even have to realize that that happens. If you're using a, a DNS gateway inside your operation, many of you are, just tell the DNS gateway to go over here. And now the users are up and running. You have a fully external disaster recovery system available to you that, until it was used, cost you a very small sum. So what do you get for considering to use the public cloud in your business continuity? You get a fairly down to zero capital investment. I say down to zero, you are going to have some cost, of course, in setting this up. Nothing comes for free, right? But you don't need a physical installation for that business continuity. This is an external site that you're paying someone else when you need it for taking care of this infrastructure. So you've got a substantial savings uh, in not having to make that infrastructure investment. Uh, and of course, that data replication, you can choose how often I want to push that. You don't have to lock into any one method here. I want to push it once a day. I want to push it once an hour. I want to push it you know, every 30 seconds. Okay? Your needs may vary, and these solutions adapt very well to your business needs. Good? All right. Our last use case, I want to look at that supply chain again. And I want to start with a supply chain uh, and, and look at when does it start to need public cloud capacity. And that's what we call burst. Okay. Uh, again, fairly common scenario where we have a supply chain. This particular customer was doing some transcode and some QC. And then based on the results of the QC, they did a manual approve for approval process. And if that process passed, they would upload that sucker to their playout. Okay, and their playout vendor was external. They were using a public cloud distribution for that already. Okay, all of this was occurring on premise. All right. Now, what, what they were limited by here was all of the content was coming from external providers. So, guess how they were trying to send it in? All right, and we were really limited by the transcode capacity. Every time that a new season of stuff came in, there would be phone calls. Can I get some temporary transcode capacity? Okay. So how did we solve that? We first looked at the overall utilization of the system. And if you looked and at your utilization today within your environment, it probably looks something like this. Whether it's an hourly change or a monthly change or a quarterly change or a TV season change, your systems have a fairly low average utilization and peak periods of, wow, I'm so glad we bought all of that, right? If we look at what really needs to be on premise, if we're gonna take advantage of cloud infrastructure, we can take a very small subset to cover 90% of the needs of the organization and then use the cloud for just those burst moments, right? And that's what we did. So we took that same workflow. We didn't modify a whole lot of the on-premise workflow. We just added within a BPM, okay, a workflow engine. Most of you have that, and if you don't, there's so many vendors that have one. You probably have one sitting in a tool that you may not even realize yet. We just added a, a transcode decision up front that said, before you start the transcode, check the state of the queue. And if the queue is this deep already, go start a clone of that transcoder in AWS, right? And then start redirecting the queue up there. Now this does have cost, of course, we've got compute costs from AWS, we've got storage costs in AWS, and I've got bandwidth costs to replicate that back to my organization here on the ground, okay? So it, it doesn't come without 
cost, but this did solve their need for having that burst capacity. And they controlled it themselves. The organization didn't have to make any further phone calls to a vendor. They weren't beholden to somebody's license key or can I get another dongle for that? This was a, let's flip that switch ourselves. Okay, and no major workflow modification here. This was done in about a week. Now, what became obvious to them, remember our first, when we, when we looked at this, what was the first thing we talked about was let's start with the edges. Once we did this edge, we looked over at that edge and they said, hey, we should probably have this whole thing actually operating in the cloud. Uh, and today this customer actually has migrated from that burst capacity to all of this capacity runs in AWS. Now what they've done is they've ported their perpetual licenses into that AWS environment. They control those, so they aren't paying the vendor anymore for that transcode cost. They only pay the vendor when they use extra. So they, they pay that as a service. But their standard 90% of their capacity needs are covered by the investment they already made. Okay, that makes sense? Very good. Well, thanks a lot for having me. Um, I'm here for a little bit. Eric Radloff is here from Dillette. Uh, and of course, you've got all of these wonderful gentlemen from Ascenti. Thanks again for having us. Appreciate it, guys.